the consequences of a bad diet, making bad dietary choices is kind of invisible today. You might not feel great or you might yeah. get a little bit of a stomach ache or whatever or feel a bit bloated, but it's almost like sowing seeds for your 100-year-old self that, you know, you, you don't yet see the consequence of. And this is why I think diet has to become a bit of a religion to some degree. But you don't see the internal damage. You don't see the shifting of your gut microbiome on a, on a daily basis. Oh, you know, I used to say this all the time to my patients. I would say, everything you're doing with your lifestyle now is preventing you from de diseases you never knew you were going to get. Because you'll never get them. Mm -hmm. So you didn't even know that the 5 a.m. workout that you chose to get up and go do is going to actually save you from Alzheimer's 20 years from now. You have no idea the fasting lifestyle that you committed to is actually going to save you from some kind of hormonal cancer. Like the list it goes on and on because you're doing it today to prevent tomorrow. You don't, and so there's no like reward on that front because prevention doesn't come with like a ribbon. You use the word ketones you, and you used it in the context of fasting. Does that mean that you're a, an advocate of the ketogenic diet? Because this, mm. the word is the same. Yeah, thank you for asking this, because this gets confusing a lot. Um, I'm an advocate of pulsing in ketones, and my way of encouraging people to do that is through fasting. Why not the ketogenic diet? So the ketogenic diet has some upsides, just like Ozempic has some upsides, and it has some downsides. So moving processed carbs out of your diet is always a good idea. Bringing your carb level down so your blood sugar comes down, always a good idea. But when the ketogenic diet came out, what ended up happening is people were just eating meat or eating, you know, fat, and they were eat weren't eating any fruits and vegetables. Okay, for women, fruits and vegetables are really important. You got to have that fiber to feed a set of bacteria in your gut that break estrogen down. So I, that's why when I talk about keto, I always say it's ketobiotic because I brought the carb level back up. I was like, yes, yeah, stay off of processed carbs. But if you want a ketone, you're going to get that ketone by attaching a fasting window to every single day and learning to metabolically switch. So you get over here and you make a ketone from fasting, not from manipulating your food over and over and over again, which has a long-term challenge. How long do I have to fast for in order to metabolically switch? Yeah, so eight hours is usually what they say where the, the system starts to move from sugar burner to fat burner. It usually takes about four hours to get over there. So we always say 12. For, for additional hours. Yeah. Okay. So, well, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. So 12 hours. And now you're pretty much over into this fasting window. Your intelligent body, what it's doing is it's saying it's been 12 hours. Glucose hasn't gone up, gone up and we haven't had any nutrients. Well, we're going to switch into our other fuel source and we're going to burn fat to make a ketone. So everybody's a little different because some people don't switch as easy. Some people take a little longer to make a ketone. I mean, we, we saw some incredible hurdles that people hit trying to get into the fasted state that were because what I call their metabolic switch was sluggish. They had never really practiced this before. And so it didn't, when they were going 12 hours, all of a sudden they weren't making a ketone and they were just hungry. And so what we started to do is teach them things like, okay, let's, this is, this is a large reason why the new book is around is because I needed to create a food manual to help them clean up their food system so they could switch over into the fasted system much easier. If I'm drinking, you know, coffee or water or these kinds of things, is that going to interrupt the process of metabolically switching? You should be fine with water. Now, I have definitely seen some really extreme cases where people even have a blood sugar spike from water, but very extreme. Uh, coffee, most people will do okay with coffee. Uh, it's what you put in your coffee that's a problem. If it's just black coffee? Black coffee should be fine. Okay. Now make sure it's chemical free. Don't, don't, you know, make sure it's organic. Like there's a, like make it, make it clean. So those two are, are pretty, are pretty good. Um, teas can be fine to drink in the fasting window. Um, what are the common mistakes people make when they're intermittent fasting? That, or, you know, the common myths around the process that, someone who thinks they know it's intermittent fasting could well be making. So if we stay in the fasting window idea, 
Um, I'll tell you a couple of that I've seen, like people drinking diet, diet, a diet drink that has chemicals in it. And so, and or or a, or a synthetic sweetener that actually stimulates hunger. So, you know, some of the diet drinks that are out there, there's a whole bunch of them. So people think I can just drink, if we go with the mistake, people just think I can drink whatever I want then. It's just not eating. I've even had questions of, can I, can I do fruit juice? <laughs> I'm like, no, it's not not eating. You're trying to get your blood sugar down so you switch over into this ketogenic energy system. So I would say the fasting window, people can trip over themselves a little bit. Then I would say, you know, of course, women specifically fasting all the time. That's why I, I did Fast Like a Girl was women needed to know how to fast to their cycles. Uh, the other mistake that uh, people make is they think, well, they don't have to clean up their food. And that's your, that's your you know, that's your prerogative. But if you clean up food, your food system, you're going to make fasting a lot easier. So I think those are some of, some of the biggies. I would say other ones that might be helpful for people listening, and I'm thinking about the conversation with your girlfriend, is thinking that there's a one-size-fits-all for fasting. Like some people like to skip dinner. Other people like to skip breakfast. I have plenty of people in our community that do lunch-to-lunch -lunch fasting. You get to decide where your eating window goes. It's not a, there's, and, you know, there's a lot of theories, like I'm a big fan of eat in the light, don't eat in the dark. When you eat in the dark, melatonin's in, and melatonin makes you more insulin resistant. So eat in the light and just make that your fasting window. Look at the, what the light patterns are. So there's some really good evidence there, but it's all customizable to you and your lifestyle. Oh, I have, I have patients and friends who are like sitting down at the table for dinner with my family is the most important moment of my day. And that happens at eight o'clock at night. And so I'm like, great, eat then, enjoy that experience and build that. Maybe your fasting window is two to nine or 10. You must have so many people that listen to your work, read your books, and then they still can't do it. They still can't fast. They still get beaten by the hunger craving that comes at 11 p.m., and then the, the next day at 8 a.m., it yeah. just wins. It just keeps winning. And they're listening to you over and over again, but the hunger cravings, the sugar cravings just keep winning. And they just keep failing at this idea of fasting. You know, I, it's funny because maybe I just don't see it as much. I mean, we've get hundreds of thousands of comments across our socials, you know, every week. And I try to, I try to keep a pulse on them. Um, but so I may not see all the, maybe the people who can't fast, maybe they don't leave comments even. So, um, but there was a really interesting study called the Every Other Day Diet. And the other, Every Other Day Diet, this years ago, was a researcher who took a group of people who were in a metabolic crisis. And like their cholesterol was high, their hemoglobin A1C was high, their liver enzymes were off, blood pressure. I mean, everything was bad. And they were eating the Western standard diet. And she said, you can eat whatever you want, but you're going to do it every other day. So one day, eat, go to town. One day, you're not eating at all. You're fasting all day. And then the next day, go to town, eat whatever you want, and then you're fasting. And you're going to do this for a year. And so they ended up doing it for a year. Now, I want to point out, there was like a third of the people that dropped out. Of course. Yeah. So we have to like point that out. Um, but everybody that stayed in it, at the end of the year, all their metabolic markers improved. They lost weight. But the thing that shocked the researchers the most is that their taste buds changed. What they craved changed. So it, when they hung in there and they did it over a period of time, all of a sudden they went from you know, craving a hamburger and fries to, create, to you know, craving a salad with some protein on it. And that was very unconscious. And I've thought a lot about that study and like, why did that happen? And I believe it happened because of the microbiome changes. Our taste buds are not always a brain decision. Sometimes they're a microbe decision. And if I have a set of bad bacteria because I've been feeding bad bacteria, you know, these toxic foods, then yeah, I'm going to keep craving it. And yeah, this gets difficult. But if I stick with it long enough, if I keep fasting and trying it and experimenting with it, and I, and I make enough progress that I can change my microbiome, then there's a door in because now my food cravings can start to change. How does, the, how does fasting change your gut microbiome in that situation? This is a great question. So uh, 
biggest criticism, one of the biggest criticisms of fasting is it destroys your gut. So I want to unpack this one. So here's the here's what the science is showing. When you are in a fasted state, the longer you're there, the most famous study was out of MIT, 24-hour fast. You started to get these stem cells into the gut that repaired the gut. But when you're in a fasted state, these bad bacteria get starved out. And when they get starved out, there's an opportunity. Now, here's what I want to want to say because the criticism is that fasting destroys your gut microbes. So, first, yes, it destroys the the ones you no longer want. Now, second thing is that first meal matters. That first door into your food matters. And if you bring in probiotic, prebiotic, polyphenol foods, uh, my favorite thing to break a fast with for years was an avocado with sauerkrauts and hemp seeds on top of it. If you bring all of that in, now you're actually feeding those good bacteria and there you're helping them grow. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.